In 1987, ABC correspondent Bill Blakemore wrote in the Washington Post that Stanley Kubrick's adaptation of Stephen King's The Shining is, quote, explicitly about the genocide of the American Indians. Every frame, word, and sound of it. This particular interpretation of The Shining has been amplified by many other critics and theorists, none more influential than the filmmakers behind Room 237, a documentary compiling various interpretations of the film. Um, and this movie is a movie about, among other things, the blood on which nations are built, certainly the United States with the genocide of the American Indians. The Shining is secretly about the genocide of the indigenous Americans. Built on stolen native land, the Overlook is founded on cruelty. Another major aspect of the film that engages speculation is the film's depiction of violence particularly domestic or systemic violence. It's clear how afraid Danny and Wendy are of Jack. While these two interpretations have been placed as alternative ways of understanding the film, I think it's imperative to connect these two themes and read them in tandem in order to understand what I believe is the true message of The Shining, the cycle of violence, and the legacy of American expansionism, otherwise known as Manifest Destiny. To understand how these themes interact, it's important to maintain our analysis around what the film explicitly tells us, or at least cues us to interpret. While the majority of the film is explicitly ambiguous in its presentation, you will need to come at it from a very particular perspective, relative to the film's explicitly stated narrative and thematic contents. In particular, it's important to analyze three different aspects of the film. The historical context that informs the film's narrative, the historical context surrounding the film's release, the dynamics between the film's characters, primarily the paternal relationship between Jack and Danny. By understanding the interplay between these three various aspects of the film, not only can we achieve an interpretation of the film that aligns interestingly with that of Stanley Kubrick himself, but we can analyze the racial, social, and societal politics that underline the film's production and distribution. The term Manifest Destiny originated in 1845, coined by American newspaper editor John O'Sullivan, writing about the American expansion into Texas and the Pacific Northwest. This belief framed America's expansion out west to be a divine right bestowed by God. The nation's strength, quote, allotted by providence for the free development of America's yearly multiplying millions, unable to be suppressed by outside or foreign interference. The idea of Manifest Destiny produced the notion that the West was, quote, fertile land on which American settlers could cultivate civilization, socioeconomic progress, and the like, ignoring the already established histories and cultures of Native peoples who resided on the land. These notions of fertility and divine purity are best symbolized by John Gatt's 1872 painting, American Progress, which depicts Columbia, a feminine symbol personifying the United States, moving angelically towards the West, bringing with her modern technology, weapons, and white settlers, while casting out the Native Americans. As symbolized through Gast's painting, Manifest Destiny, like European colonialism that preceded it, quote, arises from an ethnocentric view that one's own culture, government, race, religion, and country are superior to all others. With the primarily white settlers placing themselves as superior to the, quote, inferior Native Americans. As the United States expanded further west into the Pacific Islands in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, poet Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem titled The White Man's Burden, justifying imperial conquest as the burden of the white man to grant civilization to the Philippines and non-white areas in general, like Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii. The first few verses of the poem read, Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, go send your sons to exile, to serve your captives' need. While this poem was created after the Indian Wars of the 1880s and 1890s, it represents the racialized colonial philosophy of the United States, and symbolized the doctrine of manifest destiny more broadly. Like the Great Plains and Pacific Northwest, America's expansion into the Pacific Islands was read as a product of their divine right to spread civilization beyond continental borders. Another point of interest is the phrase, quote, go send your sons to exile, 
as if to suggest a generational continuity of expansionism extended from fathers to sons. Kipling's poem is explicitly referenced by Jack. You set him up and I'll knock him back, Lloyd, one by one. White man's burden, Lloyd, my man. White man's burden. Other various allusions to westward expansion in native cultures are present throughout the film. The film also alludes to the Donner Party, a group of white settlers along the Oregon Trail en route to California, who, like the Torrance family, were shut in by snow and forced in isolation. The group reportedly resorted to cannibalism as a means to survive, although recent historians have contested the validity of this claim. The surviving members of the group eventually made it to California, and with the eventual discovery of gold in 1848 and subsequent rush of settlers into the territory, the Donner Party served as an inspiration for other westward-bound Americans. The Overlook Hotel is introduced as a product of American expansionism. Construction started in 1907. It's finished in 1909. The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. The influence of expansionism is rooted within the hotel's main attractions as well. Jack finds refuge in the Gold Room, a bastion of the 1920s, defined not only by its decadence, but as the golden age of American expansionism. By this time, the United States dominated the West, the Pacific Islands, and to an extent Europe, with World War I solidifying America's placement as a dominant world power. The end of Reconstruction in the 1870s and the relative failure of the Progressive Era to protect the rights of black Americans, especially within the former Confederate South, produced the conditions necessary for Jim Crow laws to blossom in the, quote, New South. Thus, the 1920s also symbolized the apex of white supremacy. It is interesting to note that the term, quote, the New South, was created by an American writer named Henry Grady, potentially the namesake for the hotel's ghostly caretaker, who in himself uses racist remarks to refer to Dick Halloran. The maze is presented as an extension of the hotel, not just in terms of location, but its expansionist roots. As Wendy and Danny first enter the maze, they playfully chase each other, remarking that, quote, this is perhaps an allusion to the crying Indian commercials of the 1970s, calling attention to the bastardization of native culture by white Americans. This commodification is explicitly referenced in the film as the hotel's main aesthetic inspiration. Are all these Indian designs authentic? Yeah, I believe uh, they're based mainly on Navajo and uh, Apache motifs. If we are to understand the hotel as a product of American expansionism, and given its appropriation of non-white cultures, then we can understand the hotel to serve as an embodiment of the white colonial ideology that presupposed American colonial expansion. The Shining was released in 1980, only five years after the end of the Vietnam War. While Kubrick would explicitly explore the Vietnam War and its impact on the American psyche in his 1987 film Full Metal Jacket, the same disillusionment and cultural pessimism that surrounded the war can be seen in The Shining. At the beginning of the film, Danny mentions that he knows what cannibalism is because he saw it on the television. See? It's okay. You saw it on the television. The Vietnam War is infamous, among other reasons, for being the first to be broadcasted on live television, with news reporters on the ground in the communist nation and in combat zones alongside the soldiers. TV broadcasts captured the brutality of the war, which in turn was viewed by millions of Americans, leading to a rapid decline in popularity and support for the campaign. Vietnam was contested within generational bounds. Younger generations tended to detest the war and American involvement in it, while other generations supported the war effort as an expansion of political unrest stemming from World War II, leading to a, quote, gap between generations. It was seen as a war created by fathers, for which the sons would have to respond, a generational cycle of violence. The cycle could be read along racial grounds, and the Vietnam War an extension of America's destiny into and beyond the Pacific, quote, lifting up the Vietnamese people from the uncivilized nature of Soviet communism. Prior to the war, Vietnam was a French colony, 
and the United States' entry into the Vietnamese rebellion could be read as an attempt to preserve the Eurocentric racial and colonial dynamics. The Shining makes no allusion to Vietnam, and as such, it would be insufficient to explicitly cast Jack or Danny in the light of the war. Yet, reading the relationship between Jack and Danny in the context of the generational gap brought about by the war, as well as the doctrine of colonial expansionism that underlined the war, provides a rich insight into the film's politics and familial dynamics. In order to understand the relationship between Jack and Danny, it is necessary to define Jack's motivation for bringing the Torrens family to the Overlook and for agreeing to take care of the hotel in the first place. The film tells us that Jack is a former school teacher from Vermont looking for a fresh start to begin a new writing project. Up until this point, the viewer may not have any inclination as to any ulterior motives. As Jack declines into madness, it seems to be justified by Ullman's explanation of cabin fever. Kind of claustrophobic reaction which can occur when people are shut in together over long periods of time. He forces his family into isolation and often lashes out at Wendy, suggesting a desire to dominate the domestic slash familial sphere. The hotel and its maze serve as Jack's vessel for instituting control, as suggested through the relative framing of each character as they move through each space. The halls of the hotel and the maze threaten to discompobulate and disorient those outside of control. As Wendy, Danny, and even Dick move throughout each space, they are typically framed in a long tracking shot with their back towards the camera. The characters, like the viewer, are unaware of what lurks around the corner potentially unaware of their fate. This is compared to Jack, who is framed relatively in control of the halls, primarily walking towards the camera. He looks over the maze, his expression signifying control over his wife and son within it. Danny and Wendy appear to be entrapped within the grandiosity of the maze, as well as the hotel itself. However, as the film progresses, Jack's psychosis grows more definite. Specifically, it is his interaction with Grady that presents the viewer with Jack's ultimate motivation. Your son has a very great talent. I don't think you are aware how great it is. But he is attempting to use that very talent against your will. And it is only after his discussion with Grady in the bathroom that Jack decides to, quote, correct his family through violent means. Given our understanding of the hotel's ideological underpinnings, Jack's will, then, is to preserve not just the Overlook itself, but the foundations of colonial expansionism slash white supremacy that are seeped within its history. Here it is also important to note Grady's British likeness. As defined earlier, Manifest Destiny is shaped by the doctrine of discovery implemented by Europeans, especially the British, which reinforced British expansion into North America. Like the Americans that adopted the violent Anglo-centric worldview from their British forefathers, Jack adopts the violent means of correction from his older British counterpart. This raises questions regarding Jack's will more broadly, and how this plays into his relationship with Danny. In the only scene in which Danny and Jack share alone, Jack tells his son, I want you to like it here. I wish we could stay here. If the hotel is meant to represent a product of colonial expansionism, and in itself is a microcosm of multi-general white supremacist rule on which the doctrine of expansionism lies, then Jack's confession to Danny can potentially be understood as his desire to prepare his son to take the mantle of white supremacy, to essentially be the Overlook's next caretaker. This can be further emphasized when read through the context of the Vietnam-era generational gap highlighting Jack's desire to prime Danny for the cycle of violence on which Manifest Destiny is maintained. This is only reinforced as Jack's writing project is presented as a facade. He refers to his work less as a tangible object, but instead as an ideological project confined within his placement as the hotel's caretaker. Has it ever occurred to you what would happen to my future if I were to fail to live up to my responsibilities? 
Danny's opposition to Jack's will, according to Grady, is rooted within Danny's supernatural, clairvoyant ability to shine. The ability to shine is defined as the ability to communicate with the past and future simultaneously. You know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Not things that anyone can notice, but things that people who shine can see. Just like they can see things that haven't happened yet. Sometimes they can see things that happened a long time ago. Wendy notes that Danny began to shine as a little boy after his exposure to violence from Jack. It is important to note that the only other character that is able to shine, Dick Halloran, is a black man. While the cause of his clairvoyance isn't expressed, it can be assumed that, like Danny, he gained his ability through violence, likely racially motivated violence. This notion is further reinforced with his revelation that his grandmother was also able to shine, calling attention to the generational oppression faced by black Americans and other non-white groups as a product only furthered by manifest destiny. But why is Danny's clairvoyance perceived as such a threat to Jack's will of preserving white colonial dominance? Perhaps this question might be best answered by first considering the main horror of the hotel, Room 237. The contents of Room 237 are situated at the center of the hotel's and the film's horror. The spectator is cued to understand the room's significance early on, with Danny asking Mr. Halloran, What about Room 237? You're scared of Room 237, ain't you? A question to which Dick answers defensively. There ain't nothing in Room 237. But you ain't got no business going in there anyway. The naked woman occupying room 237 could be read as an extension of the feminine symbol of Columbia, representing the promise of liberty, freedom, and vitality offered by Manifest Destiny. Jack is enticed by the woman. She is a representative of the values of white American colonial supremacy that he is aligned with. However, this promise is deemed an illusion, visualized by her physical degradation into an old, decrepit body. Perhaps the younger version of the woman represents an ideal form, not just of her body, but of the ideas she represents. This false illusion of power, the degradation of idealism, is something that Jack is not able to fully realize until it is too late. Contrarily, Danny is attacked by the woman, though it is unclear which version of her he saw. Although it is likely, given his opposition to Jack's will, that she was not able to entice him with her idealizations, in the same manner as she did with Jack. This understanding of the illusion of power, the false promise of manifest destiny, explains Dick's defensiveness at Danny's inquiries about the room. As a black man in America, he likely knows the false promise of liberty and is attempting to save Danny from it. This is reinforced by his decision to come back to the hotel after its true horror is revealed to the young boy. Understanding the core of the hotel as a false promise of liberty ties into the common reading of the hotel's blood-gushing elevator as a representative of the native blood on which the hotel, like America, was built. This vision so happens to be the first image Danny receives of the hotel from his shine, immediately associating the hotel and Danny's placement within it along these bounds. Danny's visions of the future provide him insight as to the hidden horrors of the hotel before he has a chance to experience them firsthand. They communicate to him explicit visions, more specifically dangers, that will occur in the future. This conjunction between shining and danger is expressed visually as Danny and Dick talk about their powers. Notice the framing of the knives above Danny, anticipating the violent dangers he faces later in the film, particularly that from his father. Like the younger generation who watched the ill-fated will of their fathers occur in Vietnam, Danny is able to see and comprehend his fate his personal manifest destiny, so to speak. He has the power to usurp his fate, usurp the cycle of violence, and by extension, the foundations of American colonial expansionism. Jack, too, has a moment of clairvoyance. Well, I dreamed that I, that I killed you with Danny. Unlike Danny, however, Jack eventually embraces this destiny and attempts to fulfill it for the sake of the hotel. Jack's dedication to violence prescribed by Grady is reinforced in their second encounter. Just give me one more chance to prove it, Mr. Grady. 
That's all I ask. He promises Grady to fulfill his duty, solidifying his commitment to the preservation, the cycle of violence, and thus, foundations of American expansionism. There's nothing I look forward to with greater pleasure, Mr. Grady. You give your word on that deal, Mr. Torrance? I give you my word. Like the Donner Party, Jack seeks to sacrifice the blood and flesh of his family in the greater pursuit of his will. In the same manner that cannibalism is understood to have contributed to the survival of the Donner Party, given the group's legacy as a North Star for other settlers, then cannibalism can be understood to fuel the body of westward migration for the American spirit, in which the nation gorges on itself in order to advance in its pursuit of land and power. Jack refers to the hotel as a wagon. Here's to five miserable months on the wagon and all the irreparable harm that it's caused me. Thus equating to a certain degree his missions to that of the Donners and other westward bound settlers. His desire to murder Wendy and Jack then is an attempt to fuel the body of the ideals on which American expansionism lies, thus reinforcing the power of white colonial supremacy. Danny's ability to shine allows him to disrupt Jack's will by communicating with Dick in an attempt to stop the cycle of violence preserved by Jack and Grady before him. Jack seeks to continue the cycle of violence, no longer by priming Danny to take its mantle, but by placing Danny as its victim, correcting Danny and the disruption to the dominant ideology slash societal norms that he represents involves removing him from the picture entirely. As Jack chases Danny into the maze, another construct of Jack's control, the film maintains the characters' differing relationships to the camera, with Danny, and by extension the viewer, running from the camera, unable to fully see what lies around each corner. Jack, by comparison, moves towards the camera. When read in terms of the generational gap, the film's climax represents the older generation's pursuit of the younger generation as a means to assert dominant ideological values. As Bill Blakemore writes, the maze represents, quote, the moral maze of America, in which we are chased by the sins of our fathers. Originally pursued to preserve the dominant ideology of American expansionism, as fathers pursued their sons to join Vietnam, Danny is now pursued as a threat to its survival. Danny runs away from the ideology that his father represents. His footsteps produce tracks in the snow for the older generation to follow and hunt, landmarks that will surely lead to his demise as foretold by his visions. Danny traces his steps backwards, signifying a shift in his mindset. As the filmmakers from Room 237 interpret, Kubrick shows us how you escape from the nightmare of the past by retracing your steps, as Danny does in that last line, which means acknowledging what happened or learning about the past and then getting out. Uh, only if you are going to be able to shine and see what the patterns are so you know how to get away from them and avoid them. By backtracking in the snow, Danny vehemently evades the pursuit of the older generation towards a future slash promise of bloodshed brought about by colonial expansion and the attempt of the previous generation to instill its values into the younger. He usurps his ill-fated destiny, thus usurping the cycle of violence that Jack threatens him with. Danny's rejection of the cycle is made visually apparent in the flip of the camera angle. As he runs out of the maze, he runs towards the camera, whereas Jack is primarily framed from behind. He now actively controls his destiny, no longer bound by the whims or ideologies of the previous generation, which allows him to escape the maze and the confines of the hotel in general. However, as history has it, that is not to say that the ideology underlying Manifest Destiny was entirely usurped with Danny's escape from the cycle of violence. The film's ending images of the 1921 ballroom suggest a larger, repetitive history of oppression at the heart of the hotel that is centered around the preservation of the dominant ideology. Many interpretations have noted the fact that Jack can be thought out, and with it, the ideologies he represents. Well, it was supposed to suggest a kind of um, uh, evil reincarnation mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. um, 
where uh, he is part of the hotel history, uh, just as in the in the uh, men's room when he's talking to the former caretaker, mm-hmm. ghost of the former caretaker, who says to him, you know, you are the caretaker, you have always been the caretaker, mm-hmm. I should know I've always been here. Uh, one is merely suggesting some kind of, um, you know, endless cycle of, um, of, of this evil reincarnation. Mm-hmm.